Hey, good afternoon everyone. I am Dr. B. D. Shanoi. I am the Managing Editor of uh, MicroAsia, Journal of uh, Modern Mycology. Today we have uh, Professor Thomas De La Cruz. Uh, he is a professor from the University of Santo Thomas uh, in, uh, in the Philippines. He has kindly agreed to give a talk on uh, slime molds and uh, Professor uh, Thomas did his bachelor's and master's degree from the Philippines. Then he did his PhD from the from the university of from a university in the in Germany. Uh, I request Professor uh, Thomas De La Cruz to start his presentation, please. Thank you. All right. So um, good day, everyone. So let me first thank the organizers, uh, particularly the MicroAsia, for inviting me to deliver this short talk on slime molds. So let me begin my talk by saying that this is actually a fungus. And this is also a fungus. But this one is not. This is actually one of what we call slime molds or myxomycetes. While um, slime molds and fungi have similarities in their morphological traits, Recent molecular methods shows that slime molds form a group that are actually distinct and distinct from that of your fungi. Now let me tell you a story on how I became interested with this organism. When I was a young faculty member in our uh, department, sorry, um, in one of our courses, I came, uh, we did the culture of soil microorganisms. And in, in that uh, laboratory experiments, I was able to see this cytoplasmic streaming. And this cytoplasmic streaming is actually from the plasmodium of your slime molds. Here is uh, an image of your uh, plasmodium. They feed on anything it comes in contact with, whether it be bacteria, algae, um, yeast, even fungal spores. They usually reside on um, moist, damp environment. However, when that conditions change, let's say they dried up, they start forming what we call protein bodies. Now, just like your fungi, these protein bodies produce spores, which then germinates into amoeboid flagellated cells, and then later fuse to form your plasmodium. Now, what is fascinating about slime molds? If you look at the protein bodies, their average size would be around one to four millimeter. But I guess the beauty lies in details. When you look at the structures of these slime molds under the microscope, you would see an intricate um, structures, as you have seen in this image. Slime molds are also food for many insects. There were studies that shows uh, ants and beetles feeding on the protein bodies or protein structures of your slime molds. You could probably imagine a kid eating like a cotton candy with this, with this image. And recently, slime molds were on the news. They were, per, uh, per, uh, they were on the news because of their perceived wisdom. This study or this re uh, report says that slime molds are highly intelligent organisms because they could actually discover the shortest route into their food source. In one paper published in 2010, they laid out some food particles in a map, okay, and then they placed a slime mold. The slime mold was able to form a network connecting these food particles. This network actually showed the Tokyo subway lines. Recently, slime molds were also shown capable of solving a maze. They were able to find their uh, way to their food source in a maze. And this is actually amazing given that these organisms do not have brains. And in recent study, they said also that slime molds are learning beings. In this experiment conducted by Audrey de Sautour from France, um, they trained their slime molds to cross the gel bridge, as you could see here, 
towards their food source. What is interesting is that they place a chemical, a non-toxic chemical, but obnoxious chemical in this gel bridge. And they train the slime molds to actually ignore this toxic chemical or this, this non-toxic chemical or obnoxious chemical, uh, chemical in order for them to cross uh, the bridge and towards their food source. What is more amazing is that when they place two uh, trained slime molds together with one untrained slime mold, okay, this untrained slime mold acquired that trait and ignored the chemicals in this gel bridge in order for it to find its food source, even though that untrained slime molds never encountered this chemical. So this process is what we call habituation, okay? And uh, they say it's a reflection of the unique intelligence that these organisms have. How do we actually study slime molds? I had an opportunity to attend the first workshop on myxomycetes in Southeast Asia in 2008 in Thailand. And this was conducted by Professor Steven Stevenson, one of the leading uh, global experts on slime molds. And in that training, I learned how to collect slime molds in the field. So basically, you just need to look for piles of uh, decaying lip litter or decaying logs. And when you search or look at these uh, materials, you will be able to find floating bodies of the slime molds. These decaying materials would harbor, harbor a lot of microorganisms to which slime molds would feed on. Now, once you have collected the floating body of the slime molds, you then place them in the herbarium boxes. You just glue them in these herbarium boxes. And then you bring them, of course, to the laboratory. But while also collecting for floating bodies in the field, we also collect substrates. So this could be any lip, lip, lip material or twigs, parts of trees, or even uh, and then we place them in what we call moist chamber. These are basically petri plates with, uh, lined with filter paper or tissue paper. We cut our substrates into small strips or small pieces, place them inside this moist chamber, add water, soak it for 24 hours, and then we remove the water. Now, if spores are present uh, on your substrates, they will germinate to form, of course, your plasmodium. And then as the moist chambers dried up, this will stimulate the slime molds to form protein bodies. Now, once you have the protein bodies of your slime molds, you can then identify them based on their morphological traits. Well, looking at their stalk or the spore mass or the spore and then you also need to examine the spores of the organism okay, in order for you to be able to identify them fully. Okay, so now that you know how to identify micro uh, myxomycetes, when I was starting doing a project on these organisms, my first question was how many species of myxomycetes do we have in the Philippines? Hence, in our early reports, they were concentrated on documenting the species of slime molds that are present in the country. Here are some of the slime molds that we were able to uh, record from uh, forest habitats that we studied in the Philippines. And as you could see in this uh, figure, you see that we were able to cover many areas in Luzon, but unfortunately many areas or many parts in the country, particularly the Visayas and the Mindanao region, were not covered. Okay. But our study has increased the number of myxomycetes research or myxomycetes species in the Philippines from 107 in 1981 to 150 in 2015, and then just recently we updated it to 158. Now that we know what species of myxomyces are present in the country, the next question that I ask myself would be, what else can we do with these myxomyces? 
and another opportunity for me to learn more about mixed and matched scheme when I attended or when I participated in a Fulbright Fellowship in the U.S., this time directly working with Professor Stephen uh, Stevenson from the University of Arkansas. We were uh, interested with what we call tropical myxomycetes. We know that uh, the number of species of plants and animals actually increase from the fall towards the equator. So that means that in the tropical region, there will be more species of plants and animals as compared to the temperate region. Uh, surprisingly, myxomycetes do not follow this con conventional idea of high having an increase or higher diversity in the tropics. What we observed so far is that myxomycetes were more abundant and even more diverse in the temperate region. And in this paper, they also stated that perhaps because of the moist condition in the tropics, this prevented these lime molds to form or to complete its life cycle. Uh, they say that slime molds are best suited in an alternating wet and dry period, which is commonly observed in the temperate region. So I asked myself then, is this actually true? Is it possible that there is higher diversity of myxomycetes in the temperate region than in the tropics? So what we did in the project is that we compare three forest types from the Philippines. So we collected samples from three forest habitats in the Philippines to represent the tropical region. And then we also collected uh, substrates from three forest types in the U.S. to represent the temperate region. We uh, gathered leaf litter, ground and area leaf litter, and twigs, and then we mainly used moist chambers to evaluate the myxomycetes species in these two uh, ecoregions. What we found is actually surprising. We found that the number of species between the Philippines and the U.S. in that particular study were not much different. We were able to record 80 species of myxomycetes in the Philippines and around 82 species, or 82 species from the U.S. We even found a higher number of collections or number of records from the tropics than that of the temperate uh, region. And when we evaluated its species diversity, we did not also observe much differences between the two, which tells us that perhaps uh, myxomycetes diversity may even be higher in the tropics, okay, as uh, expected also with other organisms. When we compare the assemblages of these two ecoregions, what is very clear is that the tropical communities grouped together and the temperate communities grouped together, indicating similarities within that particular region. Professor, can I interrupt you? Yes. Uh, there is a notification. You are sharing your entire screen. There is a, you can minimize that notification so that it can it will not hinder the your uh, slides. Uh, next, how do I do this? Next last last option on that notification. Just there is no, the, it, because I, opposite I'm sorry because opposite, I could not see anything op, op, here. I'm just seeing opposite direction screen. here. Opposite side. Uh, should I stop sharing? No 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 my screen. Uh, no 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 after that. No no this side. You can see one line now. No, no. Stop sharing. I don't see. Yeah. I see. don't see. Yeah. I don't see anything. That, that one. That one. Okay. Done. Ah. Okay. Good. Okay, Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry. Sorry for that. No problem. All right. So, so to continue. So as I was saying, it is then possible that there are many species of myxomycetes in the tropics than that of your temperate region. Uh, in fact, when we look at the recorded species of myxomycetes in the Southeast Asian region we see that only the Philippines and Thailand have more than 100 species. Many countries in the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia has less than 100 species recorded. This tells us that perhaps the reason why there are less species of myxomycetes in the tropics is because of the few studies being conducted in the tropical area. Uh, if we compare, for example, another tropical country like Costa Rica, they were able to record already 242 species 
uh, bixomycetes. And Costa Rica is about four times smaller than Cambodia. So it's possible that in the Southeast Asian region, we'll be able to find even many new species, as shown in recent studies where they have discovered uh, new species of bixomycetes from our area. So the question now would be, how do we increase interest on slime molds? And one of the strategies that we did in the Philippines is just to create a website. This one-stop shop contains all information about slime molds that are recorded in the country. It also lists down all publications, even those old publications or early publications on slime molds in the Philippines. Another strategy that we did to increase awareness of slime molds was to conduct a seminar workshop on mixomycete identification. This was done together with my two graduate students then, uh, Siti Asia Macabago and Melissa Picundo. Siti uh, eventually pursued her PhD in slime molds with Professor Stevenson in the US, while Melissa is now currently doing her PhD in China. Uh, one probably success story in that seminar workshop is this lady here, Mamineta Eloreta, a high school teacher from the Pickle, uh, Pickle region. She eventually pursued her PhD in our university and worked on slime molds. And then in 2015, we invited Professor Martin Stittler from Germany together with his PhD student, uh, Nikki Harrison Dagama, who eventually worked on slime molds too, and conducted another workshops on mixomycetes identification. We also publish or made a photo guide. The idea here is to create uh, images or to develop images of mixomycetes and then with short descriptions. Now, this photo guide can be given to local communities where they can actually um, use them in their ecotourism activities. The idea is to help uh, local tourists identify slime molds when they go, for example, visit the forest sites. But perhaps the most important strategy in uh, raising awareness on slime molds is to begin at a young age. So kids can learn about mixomycetes and we can, learn, we can make this learning fun. So while my daughter, Tiffany, uh, her first Two syllable word was actually mushroom. Uh, here she is looking at a specimen of slime molds when she was three years old. And then uh, just recently, when she was six years old, um, she was actually looking at some mixomycetes we found in our own backyard during the community lockdown brought about by, by the pandemic. here together with uh, Melissa and Mark Carascal to introduce slime molds to kids. Um, this comic book contains images or characters inspired from slime molds. We also included images of slime molds okay, in this uh, comic book so that the kids will get to know more about them. And then what is also more interesting is that we try to make this comic book more engaging for the kids. We even have prepared here um, instructions on how to make their own moist chambers at home. And this is not the only comic book that we have created. We have prepared uh, or have made or published a comic book on lichens uh, with Cristel Santiago and Shandy Gasso. And just recently, we created a comic book designed for mushrooms, again with images or with characters inspired from mushrooms and images of your mushrooms. And what is also interesting in this comic book is that we included um, a character, a scientist in the um, comic book. And this scientist, Grand Machon, is the leading scientist in Mushroom Land. And she's actually inspired from academician 
Association Kiri uh, Rimundo, one of the leading uh, microbiologists in the country. And on a personal note, the three main characters of our comic book was actually from my three daughters, Tiffany, Toriel, and Tiana. So to end my short presentations and short talk on slime molds, let me uh, give my three take home points. One, slime molds are fascinating organisms. Uh, we can use them as model organisms to study life or natural phenomena. We also need to uh, think of many organisms, uh, or for many organisms such as slime molds, we did not, did not have economic values for us to study them. If I deliver a talk on slime molds, one of the most common questions that I, I encountered is that they, they usually ask me what benefits can we get from slime molds. Though it's important for us to look at economic uh, applica or economic benefits or application of slime molds, I guess we don't really need to to uh, search for this or to make this as our primary motivation for studying uh, our organism or our biodiversity. And lastly, we need to cultivate interest in slime molds and fungi, uh, even in science at an early age. So with this, I'd like to invite you to visit our group page. You just simply type in USD Pungal Biodiversity Lab in any search engine, and then this will lead you to our group page uh, where you can find more about, more about our publications and our research activities, including our outreach programs. And if you want to post these uh, presentations, please use our hashtag USDFS. With this, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Professor Thomas. Thank you very much for your very informative and very, very interesting talk on the work you, are, your work you have been doing in the Philippines. Rohit, please ask. Hello, hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, Rohit, you are audible. Yes, Rohit, you are yeah, audible. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's very, uh, it was a very nice and informative talk by Dr. Thomas. I just want to have an idea about any zymatic study that uh, has been done for the uh, degradation of like they mostly grow on the dead uh, material and wood substrates. So any enzymatic study that has been done? Yes, actually that's uh, there are a lot of studies or there are several studies on the enzyme production or enzyme capability of slime molds. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I mean, um, Professor uh, Indira from, from India was uh, one of the leading experts working on um, enzymes of slime molds. We also did a short project with the uh, city you know, uh, looking at the enzyme activities of slime molds and we reported their ability to produce proteases, uh, which is of course expected given that they, they release these enzymes to probably degrade uh, the uh, protein structures of the organisms they come in contact with. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I also agree with uh, one of your point that uh, there has been very less study and that's why there has been very less reports of the uh, uh, myxomatous species. So I, I agree with you that we need to have more and more study on this group of organism because it has been neglected for a long time, uh, especially in, in our Indian, uh, sub Indian uh, scenario also. Yeah, that, that's true. I agree with that. So the, um, in India, for example, I know that there are uh, a couple of mixed experts, but sadly, there are no younger generations, you know, taking the, the mantle in studying uh, slime molds in the region, in the subcontinent. Yeah, and I agree with you on that one. Thank you for your comments. Uh, just can I have one more question, last question? Uh, sure, sure, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, how how can these be preserved? These are preserved in the normal scenario, just like do we preserve the normal fungi when cholesterol kind of thing, or they have a special uh, thing for preservation? Okay, uh, what we usually do in the laboratory is to preserve them as uh, herbarium specimens. So we collect the putting bodies and then um, uh, put them in herbarium boxes, and that you could actually store okay. uh, in the laboratory. However, 
whether the stored protein bodies will harbor viable cells, um, that's not always the case. Uh, basically, the herbarium is just like the, the plant herbarium or the animal um, herbarium where you only have, you know, uh, probably dead or you have dead uh, materials stored. Uh, we tried at one time to preserve, for example, uh, the amoeba flagellates. So we, we placed them in glycerol and we were able to maintain them for a month as a viable cultures. And, but then uh, there is, again, not much studies done on how to come up with a viable cultures of this organism for long, long term storage. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. That, that's all from my side. I think others are also wants to ask question, please. And thank, you. thank you, yes. Doctor Priti, please. Huh. Uh, hello, sir. My name is Doctor Priti uh, from Mumbai. Uh, sir, I have done my uh, PhD in agar cultivation of mycelium, and now I want to do my postdoc in the same field. But from last uh, four to five years, I'm trying for the postdoc. But uh, from every person I heard that there is. Uh, no such opportunity in this field because so, uh, so less people are working in this field. So would you please suggest anything in this direction so that because I want to uh, continue uh, my postdoc in this field only. I have done my PhD in agar cultivation of myxomycid. Well, that, that's very good. That's that's nice that you're working on um, uh, myxomycids. Um, I would advise you to uh, check the Pulbright Fellowship Program. So they, they, could, they would allow you to go to the U.S. Uh, you can contact Professor Stevenson. He is very much willing to uh, accept uh, students uh, or, or postdocs, uh, although I'm, I'm sure, I, I think he's about to retire, so probably you can con connect uh, with him. And if you're interested, for example, to uh, go to um, Germany, then Professor Martin Stittler is also a good option to uh, visit. And in Germany, they have uh, postdoc opportunities as well. You can you can apply for the Humboldt Fellowship or the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship, uh, so that you can have a long uh, long term uh, postdoc training in, in Germany. Uh, sir, I was in contact with uh, I'm in contact with Stephenson and Schindler. Sir. Actually, uh -huh. Stephenson has given me. Uh, uh, what you can say, uh, uh, invitation letter for four to five years, but the problem was that uh, my college management was not giving me permission, so I lost that uh, chance. And now, sir is retiring this year, I think. So, uh, hope I will uh, get some opportunity in this field. Yeah, you can also contact Brett Spiegel, but I think he's yes, working yes. more on uh, Dictus Stillets and I'm not sure with Landolf. Um, I, I only know these people personally, so I, I don't know other other researchers on the slime molds in the U.S. Um, in 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 Europe, it's uh, there are more uh, researchers working on the slime molds. I think you can also contact Dmitry Leontev from from Ukraine. Uh, he's doing phylogenetic analysis or phylogenetic studies on on myxomycetes and. Uh, I think there's also some uh, Anna Roniker from from Poland. She's also doing uh, work on, on slime molds. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, you you can send me an email uh, uh, so that I can I can connect you with with this with the people that I know if you're interested in in doing uh, post of training with them. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, it was an interesting talk, uh, Dr. Delta Cruz. I am Dr. Shashi Aika from uh, Mumbai. I, I actually I found the myxomycetes being a very curious organism. It is fun uh, looking at the different uh, bodies, and it's very interesting. Only thing, it doesn't stay for too long. But I, what I wanted to ask is, uh, is it possible to collect the substrate uh, along with the substrate, uh, and if it is dry, is it will it uh, grow again if it if it regains moisture? I mean, after yeah. after PH. Yes, that's it. That that's actually a, a strategy. You mm -hmm. can uh, get the substrates where you observe the slime molds, and then uh, if they they already form protein bodies, 
before, they probably have released spores in that substrate. And that spore can germinate again when you place them in, a, in another moist chamber. So yes, you can you can get them again. That means Although, that, uh, yes. uh, can be dried and stored. Can that yes. be? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can dry the substrates and then uh, bring them in the laboratory. That's what we usually do. We we collect dried substrates for our moist chambers because when we collect wet substrates, uh, more often we don't get slime molds because uh, fungi will just only grow first and we will uh, colonize the whole plate, okay, uh, preventing, of course, the slime moss from, from, from growing. Yeah, so you really need to draw that. Yeah, because in cities, uh, it's not uh, so commonly found. It's only when we go into the forest and we get it. By the time we come to the lab, it's all uh, the fruit bodies and all are uh, not in a uh, observable uh, condition, except for a few. But by the time we do that for all the students, it's gone. We need yeah. to yeah. So it becomes very difficult to teach myself. <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> true. I agree with that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's a very interesting group of organisms. Yeah. It's fun watching them. Yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, in. The, uh, by the way, I'm uh, my area of uh, this is pseudomycetes. I have done fungal uh, uh, biotechnology and fungal biotechnology of pseudomycetes. That is production of tax oil from uh, but I have, I'm interested in different groups of fungi also. Basically a teacher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, Professor Thomas, we have two queries on the chat box. Would you like to answer them? Please? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a question here on uh, the molecular identification of uh, mixomycetes. Uh, there are, of course, uh, recent studies that tries to incorporate molecular uh, molecular methods in identifying mixomycetes. But I guess the challenge here is that we don't have uh, an updated databases. So more, more often, those that are working on molecular identifications have their own reference database, and they would sometimes not uh, place them in, in NCBI. So it's very challenging, especially if you are uh, working on tasks that are not well studied. Uh, you might be thinking that they do not, uh, they're, they're new species simply because they do not have uh, gene sequences available if, if you will rely on molecular ID, okay? So I guess, but there are of course uh, studies being done on this. Another challenge, uh, another challenge, challenges that the, we are encountering is that it's very difficult to uh, get the DNA from the spores, uh, given the structure of the, the spores. So if we will be able to extract DNA well, then it would be easier for us to be able to um, identify or use molecular methods to identify uh, slime molds. Um, there is this paper that was published by Martin Sittler, uh, who identified the plasmodia or using molecular methods, since not all plasmodia would, would form into protein bodies. And they use molecular methods to identify uh, this plasmodia, and it actually worked. And then there is also another question here from James Niegas. Um, I was particularly interested in slime mold learning and I was just wondering how research uh, into this is progressing. Uh, what are some of the big things researchers are trying to look into regarding the topic at present? So with regards to the learning uh, aspect, what, what I, uh, I know of is that they try to uh, use slime molds as a model organisms to uh, defeat the big uh, learning processes. So in this case, in the work of the Sutur, they're trying to show that these organisms can actually um, uh, learn from their experiences. So by being exposed to chemicals, they can learn from it and then tend to ignore it. Uh, there are also researches that looks at the networks or how the uh, slime molds form networks uh, trying to understand how they could actually uh, find their their food source. In, in our laboratory, for example, we did 
one project with my graduate students, Monica Policina, and she tried to uh, check whether slime molds actually responds to music. So we expose our cultures of slime molds to classical music, to heavy metal music, and to noise. And then we want to find out whether uh, the slime molds would grow better if they are actually exposed to uh, soft music or to classical music uh, than to heavy or uh, to, to noise, if you want to call it that way. And we, we found some interesting uh, findings on this one. I also, by the way, I also posted in our chat group my email. So if you're interested to uh, message me about slime molds, you can, you can send me an email and I'll be happy to, to reply to you. Audience, any more queries? Any, more, any, any clarification you want from Professor Thomas, please? I think um, if people still have some queries, they could email to Professor Thomas, and he, I think he will be very happy to email, reply to your queries on email. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to conclude this uh, particular uh, uh, talk on slime modes. I thank uh, Professor Thomas for his kindness, for giving his time, and giving this wonderful lecture on slime modes and his, his research and his, um, you know, knowledge dissemination activities in the Philippines and I am I'm especially we thankful to the uh, our friends from the Philippines who have gathered here it's very nice to see all of you and also other members oh, we are we have around 100 people today uh, thank you very much